Uh, today we're going to be talking more about this uh, desert. You know, you got to love the desert, the, the uh, land of, of uh, wilderness. Um, I found myself a lot of times in the wilderness. Anybody else? And I usually got there because I thought I was going to the promised land, and I get to the wilderness, and I'm like, what? You know what I'm saying? Like, we get there, and we're like, man, this isn't what I thought it would be. Well, this is what happened. The children of Israel, you guys weren't here last week, the children of Israel, these are, these are the 12 tribes of Jacob, Israel. Man, Chance, I'm ringing like crazy up here, so just bring it down. <laughs> I can't talk when I hear myself like that, so, Okay. Anyway, it may just be too hot. Okay, better? Did y'all hear that? Man, that was wild. Uh, what was I talking about? Children of Israel, 12 tribes of Jacob. Man, I got a short, short, short term memory problem. Uh, 12 tribes of Israel. So they're in Egypt, they're in captivity, they're in bondage, they're slaves, and and this guy Moses is delivered, the Savior, he comes and he sets them free and they head out and they head up to the Red Sea and the, the Red Sea is in front of them and, and Egypt is behind them and they're crying out to God and they're whining and complaining, why did you bring us out here just to die? And God performs this massive miracle and the Red Sea splits and the children of Israel, millions, okay, this ain't like you know, a family reunion. I'm talking millions. Like a, they estimate like a million men. Okay? And you know, back then, man, children were everywhere. Like, the nursery was a nightmare. Million people. And you know what it's like to be on a road trip with the kids? Can you imagine walking through the desert with a million of them? Exactly. Now you're starting to feel them. <laughs> so they walk to the Red Sea. Pharaoh's behind them. Egypt's behind them. Coming to kill them. The Red Sea's in front of them. And God splits the Red Sea. And says, quit crying out to me. Get moving. And so they cross the Red Sea on dry land. But then Egypt comes after them. And as Egypt comes after them, the waters close in, and Egypt is cut off. Amazing miracle. And this is kind of our story, and I'm not going to go deep into this because I've taught this before, but, but like, this is our story, like, when we are, when we are set free, when we are transformed, when, we're, when we come into a, to an understanding uh, a faith, a, a deep understanding of who God is and who we are and a relationship there and we're set free from Egypt but we still have to leave Egypt, right? Because you can be set free and stay in Egypt but we still have to leave Egypt and when we leave Egypt we come out and we, we come to this thing that's called baptism. We pass through the waters of a new life. So we're transformed and we're changed and we're a new creation. The old life is gone and the new life has come. And we make a public profession of that through a baptism, a, a going through the water. And this is the baptism of these people as they're going through this water. And the old life is washed away and the old life is cut off. And they're a new person and they're on a new adventure and they're stepping out. And they're, they're new and they're fresh and they're clean. And this is a picture of us. This is all of our story. And then what happens is they go out into the wilderness from the Red Sea because you see it's quite a ways between the promised land and the Red Sea. There's a lot of wilderness out there. There's some things out there like, like the mountain of God where we learn and we grow in the laws and the wills of God. This is what happens to Moses with the Ten Commandments. And then, and then they go to the Jordan River, and the Jordan River is, is like a baptism into the promised land. It's like a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Like a baptism, a second baptism, a second washing, a, a cleansing after being in the desert, a cleansing before they enter the land of promise. So, so you see this whole thing is, is not just a story, but it's our story. It's the way humanity and God work. Uh, 
I'm not going to go into this next week, so I'll drop this on you and then you can read it for yourself. But, but as, as these children of Israel come to this mountain of God, after they cross through, they, Moses goes up on the mountain and receives the Ten Commandments, right? And, and the, the reason I want to drop this on you because I want you to be thinking about this. But the Ten Commandments, a lot of people believe who study the ancient language and, and, and know the culture of the day, a lot of people believe that this is a wedding ceremony. That the Ten Commandments are not laws or rules given to people, but it's a covenant between man and God in a wedding ceremony. And so as they go up before God, God says, you can't have any other girlfriends. This is his first rule. Like, if you're getting married too, that's a good one. Like, I mean, as a first rule, that would be a good one, right? And then God goes through all these other things, and he also, then he starts talking about in, these, in this commitment that they're making with each other, he's talking about how you live with each other. Don't kill each other, and don't steal from each other, and don't, don't commit adultery, and don't do these things, because this is going to break down your relationships, and when your relationships are broke down, the covenant gets broken. So God's covenant was with himself and mankind, and if mankind hurts each other, see, we're all connected. So if we sin against each other, it breaks our covenant with God. And this is all the Ten Commandments are really about. It's all the laws of God are because he loves us, and he desires this relationship with us. And so he gives us all of these commandments, our covenant, so that our relationship with him isn't broken. Here's how you live in relationship with God. And if you notice through the rest of the Old Testament, man, they cheat on God. And he calls them like whores and prostitutes and he has harsh words for them, right? Because he sees these people, humanity, as his bride. They entered into this covenant. So, so that's how this whole story becomes our story in the story of the Exodus. And I don't want to skip over that because I think it's important that you know that. But today, I want to talk about what happens right after they come out of the Red Sea and they head out across. Now, this is in Exodus chapter 15, and it's in verse... I don't know what verse it is, but I don't have a number beside it. I would say it's 25B. Does that sound right? 25C. It may be C. I don't know. It says, There the Lord made a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your healer. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm springs, and they camped there by the water. Chapter 16, then they set out of Elam, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, Sinai the mountain of God. On the 15th day of the second month, after they had departed from the land of Egypt. And that's important. 15th day of the second month. All right, 45 days. Everybody good with that? They're about. I don't know about leap day, leap year, none of that stuff. All I know is 15th day, second month. So we can understand about 45 days. Do y'all agree like that Red Sea thing was a big deal, right? Okay. Just making sure, because that's like, it's important to my story here. <laughs> so, okay, 45 days after they departed Egypt. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us into the wilderness to kill, a, to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Forty-five days 
That's a short time, right? Not 45 years, man, 45 days. It's like going, hey, remember last month when we crossed the Red Sea on dry land? And where do we go? Oh, man, life was better in Egypt. I was sitting by my meat pot. I don't even know what that is. What? But it sounds good, like a meat pot. It's not chili. <laughs> sitting by my meat pot, eating bread till I was stuffed. Good old Thanksgiving. <laughs> so they're grumbling and complaining again. This sounds familiar. It sounds like what happened before the Red Sea, which was ex right after God had brought all these plagues on Egypt and not touched them. How easy do we forget? 45 days later, after... They crossed the Red Sea after Egypt was cut off from chasing them. They were given new life. 45 days later, and they're gripping and complaining again, wishing what? Wish I was back in slavery. <laughs> At least I could eat chili. <laughs> chili and cornbread. That's... Mmm. Slavery. You're never going to eat chili and cornbread the same. <laughs> and God says to him, he says to him, I'll make a deal with you. The Lord said to Moses in verse 4, he says, Behold, I'm about to rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And on the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather daily. Okay? This is so they can take the seventh day, the Sabbath, off. So God says, I'm going to rain down meat and bread daily. Daily. Now he goes on and he says, gather as much as you can eat. And the Bible tells us that, that they gathered, some gathered little and they were filled and some gathered a lot and, and they were filled. And so everybody had enough. And they ate. And, the, and God, so God rained out in the evenings. He brought in quail. Like quail are good, man. And a lot of you guys... You had not had quail because we don't have them anymore. Like, they, we used to go quail hunting when we were kids. We'd eat quail by the dozens, and they were good. And nowadays, you just don't find them anymore. And if you do, they're real expensive. And they're a little bitty bird. You can get you a big chicken for half the price. <laughs> but fried quail is good. I don't, I don't know if God was raining down fried quail, but I'm assuming he was. That's my God. <laughs> so they had quail to eat. And then they had these flakes. The dew would settle on the ground. In the morning they'd go out and the, when the dew came off, there was what? Flakes. And the flakes were, it says like, bread with honey. Okay? Now they had been in slavery and they had never eaten probably, there were people that, that had been there that had probably never tasted sugar. But you don't get this like today because you can't eat anything without it. But these people had never tasted it. And they're eating like bread with honey. Now this is where they're headed to the promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Like not just food, but good tasting food. It's not like one of those diets where you eat rice cakes. You know, kale. Kale's what fish eat, guys. You don't eat that. Kale is what your food eats. So 
So he's providing quail, and he's providing white flaky stuff. And they call it manna because manna means what is it? We have manna often at our house. <laughs> well done, manna. <laughs> Crispy, crunchy manna. Dry manna with lots of gravy. But, but God provides this. And the thing is, he says, I'm going to do this every day. I'm going to provide this every day. And so they go out every day and they pick up their manna. And then on Saturday, on the, I mean on the, the sixth day, they go out and they go to gather their manna. And there's double portion. And so they gather double portion. Now this is important because... They couldn't gather double portions any other day. They could only gather enough for them to eat. Because if they gathered more than they could eat and they tried to keep it, it had like worms and maggots and stink when they got up the next day. It just made some of you like, I'm not really hungry anymore for chili and cornbread. <laughs> so it was disgusting. And it stunk up the place. And all of Israel, like a million people did this, and the whole place stumped. Man, can you imagine? Like, it's just horrible because they disobeyed God. So it wouldn't last overnight. And every day they had to get up, and every day they had to go out, and every day they had to pick it up, and every day they came in and they ate just enough for that day. And then on the last day, on the sixth day, they would gather double because on the seventh day, on the Sabbath, God didn't want them to do any work. He didn't want them to go out and... and and, and get their food and, and, and do these things. So that's why I don't cook on Sunday. I'm the housewife of our family, by the way. And I make a good housewife. You can ask anybody. So, so they gathered double, and then on the Sabbath they had, and it didn't ruin on that one night. It was just amazing. So they were doing this. And God was providing for them every day. Every day. But they couldn't handle that. They tried to keep and they tried to store. Because it was 45 days from the time we walked through the Red Sea. I know what God did then. But what's he going to do today? I know God provided today, but what about tomorrow? Tomorrow. Yeah, God made this for today, but I had better take control of this situation because I'm smart and I know that if I have enough for today, I need to put some back for tomorrow. How fast do we forget that we didn't make the manna in the first place and that we forget, how fast do we forget that God provided today and he will provide again tomorrow? Now me, that sounds great. That's awesome. But I freak out. Like, I'm not cool with that. Is everybody, they all are like, yeah, yeah, everybody knows that. I freak out, man, I lose it. I need, I need to know. Like, I need to know what's tomorrow. And so this is not just their story. This is our story. Because every one of us have a what is it? What is it for you? What is it for you? What is it your marriage? Is it your job? Is it your money? Is it food on the table? Is it your family? What is it? That's what the manna is. What is it? What is it for you? What is it for me? What is it that God has shown me? I walked through the Red Sea. 
I was set free. I walked through the Red Sea. I know God is able and capable. But my question is, I mean, I know that because we're pretty certain about the past. And I know those things. And I know he's capable and I know he's able. But what about today? What about tomorrow? I know he's capable and able. And so I think our question is really, will he? And then we start playing mind checkers. Right? We start playing mind checkers with God. Well, I didn't read my Bible today, so I don't know. He's going to be there tomorrow. And we start condemning ourselves, how worthless and how bad we are. Listen to me. You didn't deserve it the first day. You don't deserve it today, and you won't deserve it tomorrow. But it's not about you, thank God. He doesn't love me because he just loves me. He don't love me when I, he just loves me. He don't love me if I, he loves me. He loves you. And that's the hardest thing we get. A lot of you guys are sitting there and you look around and you go, yeah, God loves them. Look what they're doing. But, you know, I'm a screw up. God loves you. And he loves me. And he loves us the same. And there's nothing that you can do, and there's nothing that I can do, and there's nothing that you have done, there's nothing that I've done, and there's nothing that you will do, and there's nothing that I can do to ever change that. God isn't an angry kid with a magnifying glass, and I'm the ant. But do we not think God is that way? See, I don't think it's that we don't trust the provision of God. I think we don't trust that he does love us. We don't trust that he cares about us. We don't trust that he's even paying attention. Because I'll tell you this, it's hard for me a lot of times to see what's going on in the world and go, God, man, are you paying attention? I know you were paying attention back there. But did you take a nap? Are you on Sabbath? <laughs> you, you know, it's like, where are you? Do you not see what's happening to me? I don't know where my family is going to be tomorrow. I don't know where my meal's coming from tomorrow. I don't know where my paycheck's coming from tomorrow. I don't know if we're going to make it tomorrow. Where are you, God? And he's saying, did you eat manna today? And if you ate manna today... Couldn't you eat manna tomorrow? I have this theory. <laughs> I love my theories, right? <laughs> I have a theory. I have a theory that we can't handle more than one day of God at a time. That's personal experience speaking. Like, I think God gives us just enough of himself for today because if he gave us all of it, <laughs> I, I mean, we literally would just blow out. I mean, one day, enough manna. <laughs> There's this one time, though, where they start dropping and there's quail, like, waist deep. <laughs> like, I mean, he's like, oh, not enough? Have some more. Anybody ever been killed by blessing? It happens. <laughs> it happens. Noah, please make it rain. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot, right? We're like, no, I want all the blessing. Okay. Swimming in quail, feathers. You know, I mean, I, man. But then, then we get in a rhythm, right? And we do what, get this though. 
Manna fell on the ground and quail fell on the ground, but somebody had to go out there and pick it up. Like a lot of times we're like, God's just not blessing me. God, he's blessing all around. He's just not blessing me. <laughs> Look, they're eating quail. They're eating manna. I wish God had blessed me. It's not fair. It's not fair. We live in a generation of it's not fair. Hey, wake up. You've got to go outside and pick up the blessing. The blessing isn't inside. We must go outside and pick up the blessing. And then people will be sitting inside and talking about you. Not there. They're, so, they're blessed. I'm not. I call it blessing envy. Big deal in the church. Blessing envy. In the church, people have blessing envy. They have gift envy. It's like, why does she get to sing like that? And I can't even sing a lick. <laughs> and you just sit there and pout about it, not realizing that you have 10,000 gifts you're not giving away. And so why don't you try giving some of your gifts away, and then you'll realize the blessing. Oh, we really sit in the corner and gripe about what others have and what we don't. We'll pick it. We'll paint up sides and we'll pick it because they're blessed and we're not. If all the people who pick it, everything would get off their butts and do something, there would be nothing to pick it. But it's going on in the church. I mean, we may not have signs, but we're picketing. I'm not getting mine, so I'm not doing it. I'm not. Get up and do something. Then there would be nothing to gripe about, and you'd just be like, well, I don't even know what I'm going to gripe about. There's no reason to go to church today. That's right. The big boy pants. Pull them up. Get this, though. A lot of times we walk in this blessing and we go out and pick up manna, man, and we get in a rhythm of life. Six days in rest, 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 and we're picking up manna, and we're eating quail, and we're picking up manna, and we're eating quail, and we're picking up manna, and we're eating quail. We're picking up manna. We're eating quail. What's for breakfast? Let me guess. Manna. What's for dinner? Well, let me guess. Quail. See, my wife does this. We go to a restaurant. I already know what she's going to order. Any restaurant we go to, she has one thing she orders at that restaurant. So it's like, what are you having, manna? What are you having, quail? Man and quail, man and quail, man and quail. And the thing is, it's like this all the way through, all the way through the wilderness. And actually, when they go into the promised land, it's the last day man and quail fall. Because once you get to the promised land, man, you have to go pick your own. Because, like, it's a land flowing. But when you're in the desert, man, it's not flowing. They were like, there's no water. God says, pick up that log, throw it in the water. The water, the bitter water became becomes drinkable water. They're like, it's dry. We can't, we ain't got no water. We're going to, we go back to Egypt. I want to go back to Egypt. But Moses strikes a rock. Water comes out rock. God can make water come out of rock. If he can split a Red Sea, he can make a water come out of a rock. He can provide your need for tomorrow. Amen. Just don't look 45 days from now and go, God can't even feed me. I'm going to go back to Egypt. There are 45 days. You want to go back to Egypt every 45 days? No, but I sure do every first when the rent comes due. <laughs> Mom, can I come back? No, I blocked. <laughs> Wrong number. <laughs> no, we got... <laughs> Every 30 days, man, it's like, God's not going to provide it. I can't make it. I don't know what we're going to do. Six days in a rest, six days in a rest, six days in a rest. And then, for years and years and years and years and years and years, and the blessing of God daily. And all of a sudden, the blessing of God no longer feels like a blessing but a curse. And how does that happen? Because we forget who's providing. 
I think we forget the provider, right? There's times when God is, is moving in our lives, and, 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 and so we move on. I talked about that a couple of weeks ago, but, but man, so many times we just get in the routine six days and rest, and we forget where it comes from. See, the thing about manna is you don't make it. It's the same thing about money. You don't make it. God gives us that. It's not yours. God, God provides that. He provided it for you in the past. He'll provide it for you tomorrow. He provides it for you today. And you're like, I don't know where it's coming from. It's coming from God. And when you forget that, you become unappreciative of what you do have. It's always good to go into a really, really destroyed, broken down home or neighborhood. Because so many times we're like, a stupid TV is only 50 inches. <laughs> and the fourth one's on the fritz, it's broken. So you only got three 50 inch TVs. Wait, man. I'm so sorry for you. But we forget where the manna comes from. And that's why we get into this doubt thing of like, who's going to provide the manna tomorrow? And this happened to them, man. This is, their, this is our story because it's their story. They're out in the wilderness, and this is in Numbers chapter 21. And the people spoke against, in, in verse 5, uh, uh, Numbers 21, 5. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Guess what they're saying again? Why did you bring us out here to kill us? Man, I was going to kill you. I'd have drowned you in the Red Sea. <laughs> but, you know, that's what I feel like God's saying. Look, I'm about had it with you. You know, like when you're on a road trip with the kids? You know, I about had this with this complaining. I'm fixing to pull this car over. That's like God in the, when they're in the wilderness. About to pull this car over. And the people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? Sing me a new song. <laughs> and you have people in your life that complain about the same thing all the time. Next time they do this, say, why have you brought us out into the wilderness to kill us? <laughs> and if they don't know what you mean, just keep it to yourself and go, yeah, I burned you. <laughs> Like, and you don't even know you were burnt. Like, this, you can have inside jokes with yourself. I do that all the time, and people don't look at me like, you're a freak. <laughs> Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? But get this. This is the people in my life. For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. One translation says, there is no food and no water, and we hate this manna. <laughs> That's my kids, man. Standing in front of a refrigerator that you can't put anything else in. We don't have nothing to eat in this house. <laughs> and I hate this manna. Man, when you're sitting there and you just listen to yourself and you go, we are going to starve to death because we have no food and I hate this food. <laughs> when you say that to yourself, man, you need to just back up and bang your head against the wall. It's always worse when you sound stupid to yourself. <laughs> like you know the complaining's gone overboard when you start sounding stupid to yourself. But we lose scope, don't we? 
We lose, we lose perspective. I don't know what your man is. What is it for you? I don't know. What is it for me? I have a pretty good idea. <laughs> and you forget. We complain about my husband this, my husband that, my wife this, my wife that, and then you meet somebody who lost their husband or wife, and you're like, man, I'm a moron. My kids are driving me crazy, and you meet somebody who just lost their kid. And you thank God they're driving you crazy. See, it's so easy to lose scope. So far in my life, I have never been in a situation that I haven't found somebody who had it worse. We notice everybody who's got it better. Like, we're fully aware of that. But take time this week and look around and go, man, I am blessed. I look at this thing, man, and I, I, I look and I'm like, I don't know how you can handle that. I don't know if I could handle your circumstance. I don't know if I could handle your situation. I say things like that all the time. And they, everybody who I've ever said that to, I don't know how you do what you do. I don't know how you handle it. I don't know how you go through it. The answer is always the same. I get up every day and I go through it today. You can always find somebody who you look at and go, I, I couldn't handle what they're going through. But you can handle anything because you get up every day and you go out and you pick up the manna because somebody loves you. The manna giver. Here's the thing. For it to be manna means it has to be something because what is it means that there's at least something there. And that thing that's there may be the blessing. Now, it may not feel like, look like, like you can never think, man, some of our circumstances, some of our situations, some of your manna that you guys are going through right now, the what is it in your life? You're like, there's no way this is blessing. There's blessing. And there's blessing because anything we're going through in our life can remind us where our daily strength comes from. See, the reason we have manna and the reason we eat quail is because we need strength daily. And even though those are food things and we need strength physically, those are faith things and we need strength spiritually. And what doesn't kill us does eventually make us strong even though we wish it would have killed us. What is it? I don't know what it is for you. How am I going to get through it tomorrow? I don't know how you're going to get through it tomorrow. It's good to see you today. It really is. And we can go through anything because we know the one who provides manna. And not only do we know him, and, and listen, you may be sitting here today and you're like, I don't, I don't really believe that there's a God. I don't know about all this Jesus stuff and I don't know about all this church stuff. I'm just here because whatever. Whatever. Like, I was looking for a dark room to go into. <laughs> like, I don't know why you're here. I didn't have nothing else to do on Sunday morning. But whether you call this thing the universe or you call this thing uh, it or you call this thing Mother Nature, you, you just, or you just say there's something out there, everybody understands that there's something bigger than us holding us all together. Like we're all in this together. There's something bigger than us that's providing for us because we are create. We may create out of what's created, take things that are created, but when you break everything down to its root, man, somebody put it here. So you're just creating out of what already is. We know that there's something bigger than us at work. We know that there's this that there is this force that's bigger than us that makes us all connected. Bible just says that they call it God, and it's like God is in us. That's what that 
those feelings or that knowing in us that we're all connected or that there's something bigger, that drawing to something bigger. We know that God, the Bible says that God is in us, but then that we are in him. And that's that sense that we know that we're all in this together, that everything that you and I do matters to each other. And that's why I look at you and I go, I can't see how you go through that. And you look at somebody else and go, I've been through that. I know there's a tomorrow for you. Well, let me encourage you. I know there's a tomorrow for you. See, we all have this gift, these gifts of blessing. We all have this something to give. None of us are without something to give. And it's because we understand that manna is given. We go out and we pick it up and it's going to be there every day. But I'll go about tomorrow. So we come back to where we started. What we have to get to is that this universe, this, this thing that's unseen, this God that's within us and that we're actually within loves us without condition. That's huge. Even though I try, man, I cannot love unconditionally. Like, that's hard. Like, you can come close with your kids, but man, every once in a while, you're just like, <laughs> you know, I brought you in, I can take you out. <laughs> it's love. <laughs> it's love, man. So when, when we worry about tomorrow, or we stress over what we don't have, or what somebody else has, or we don't know what it is, or we... Are we, are we are going to starve to death because we hate this food? We have to remember that we're loved and it's not on condition of what you have done, can do, should do, or will do. God just loves us. And today he's going to provide for us. And if you try to pick up enough for tomorrow, it's going to stink. Because he provided for today. Because he wants you to love him and trust him again tomorrow. And he wants you to love him and trust him again tomorrow. And he wants you to love him and trust him again tomorrow. And the minute that we don't trust him for tomorrow, and we say, I better take care of this, he starts to come unraveled. I can't tithe. I got to pay my bills tomorrow. That's cool. Do what you think you got to do, stinking manna keeper. No, <laughs> do what you think you got to do, man. But I'm telling you, you will never provide enough for you. You better know that there's something bigger than you providing your manna for tomorrow because you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You, you love your kids today. You love your husband today. You love your wife today. You cherish your parents today. Because I know that I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And I told Elle, I know everything. <laughs> so if I don't know, then you don't know. Right? <laughs> All right. You guys stand up with me.